а, първата ни официална лекция от а, не съвсем бивш доброволец, а от най-чистокръвен лектор, ще бъде за HTTP 2 стандарта и едно по-здълбочено един по-здълбочен поглед в него. На вашето внимание, Ники Папазов. Моля, аплодисменти. Hi everyone. I'm really happy to be here and to enjoy with you these two awesome days that are here at us. Let me introduce myself. My name is Nikolai Papazov. I started my career as a Java developer at Russia. Then I moved to the professional service organization of a company called Tumbleweed, where I work as a consultant. And then, since 2006, I joined Software AG organization, where I'm still working. It's been almost 12 years, by the way. So, I do enjoy good beer, and it starts to become obvious. Another thing that I join is a good technology. And what I would like to share with you is what I have found interesting about HTTP2. I want to show you some statistics before we go. This is the site V3 Tech, which examines the web and makes some statistic and shows some trends. This is the trend for HTTP2. And I would like to go and compare it with other standards that they are out there on the web. And if you click on the quarterly report, we see this line. By the way, is it visible good enough? Or I need. So the point is that in 2015, the adoption of HTTP2 was 1.4%. And now it's about above 30. If we scroll down, we we'll look that starting at the beginning of at October of 2015, it was right down here, and it go up to 30%. So this is a huge trend, and if you think about it, have you observed it, something like before? 30% in three years? It sounds really amazing. Actually, it's like a little revolution going out there, but without the head chopping. So we see what this means. HTTP2 is trying to solve a performance problem. And when we talk about performance, we need to consider what we would like to measure. How many of you have been dealing with performance problems? Yeah? Let me see your hands. Uh, that's good quality and quantity. Hope the rest, of, the rest of you never see performance problem, but they will eventually come. So when you're dealing with the performance problems, you need to measure. And you need to know what is the current state of the system, and you need to know where you want to be, basically how you want to improve. And when we are measuring the performance of the web, we are measuring the page wall time. And right now, I'm going to show you uh, Akamai's web page compared to HTTP 1.1 to HTTP 2. I reload the page. It says that the browser supports HTTP 2. And now we have an image which is uh, built up by a lot of images. And we can see how the image is built based on HTTP 2 1.1. And we see the same thing with HTTP2. Was this fast? I think it was fast. What do you think? Come on. Was it fast? Uh, do I need to run it again? OK. Let me show you again. So HTTP 1.1, getting images one by one, building the image. Okay, and HTTP2. 
What we need to see here is the latency. We see that the latency is in milliseconds, and for HTTP 1.1 is 205 milliseconds, and the total page load time is above 12 seconds. While compared to HTTP 2, we have a latency of 216 milliseconds, but the load time is two seconds. So it's six times faster. So what we will see in the next 20, 30 minutes, how this is actually achieved. How many of you have been using internet since 1996? Okay, let me see your hands. Okay. So this is how the internet looked like back then. So I know that there is a computer museum in Sofia, but I don't know if this, is, this can be seen here. So what we can see is a simple image, a uh, simple page with a few images and few hyperlinks. Nothing fancy, just a HTTP uh, text. And this has changed a lot for the last 20 years. And when we're talking about performance, we need to consider two factors. One is the bandwidth, and the other is the latency. So the bandwidth is actually the bit rate of which the information falls. And the capacity is the time interval, which is between the stimulation and the availability. Basically, it's the time delay. So in the last 20 years, we have been witnessing a huge improvement in the bandwidth area. So we are not using any more dial-up modems. We have optics. We have 4G, 5G. But about the latency, nothing has changed. So if we are having two computers sitting next to each other and they are connected with 100 megabit uh, connection, they can talk, uh, they can exchange information at this side. But that's not the case. Usually, the client is sitting here and the server could be somewhere on another continent. And the latency is a factor which we cannot deal with. If we look at the history, we need to start in 1919 with the first version of the HTTP protocol, which is 0 0.9, and it has simple request response. Later on, six years later, we have added the headers to the request and response, and in 1999, we have added the famous header, which is connection keep alive, which make us use the connection and not close it with each request. Of course, this was all good. It was needed to bootstrap the World Wide Web, but it was not good enough at some point. And this was observed at Google, and two people started to develop a new protocol, which is called Speedy. These people were Mike Belshe and Roberto Pion. So, they wanted to improve this, and what happened is in 19, uh, 215, there was the RFCs published for both HTTP2 and HPAC stacks. The goal of Speedy at Google at that time is that they need to reduce the total page wall time and they wanted to reduce by 50%. So this is a hard target. They wanted to do that without asking the authors, authors of the web page to do any changes. So basically, a page which was implemented to work for HTTP 1.1 should be working with HTTP 2. Another important challenge that stood in front of them was that they need needed to do that 
without changing anything in the existing infrastructure. So this is not like changing the time. So from tomorrow, we are starting using HTTP2. No, it has to work on the existing infrastructure, on the existing routers, switches, and all the equipment which is out there. And they, need, they wanted to develop this with the partnership with the open source community, which it happens. And now, this is a widely used standard. When they make the performance test, they see that it's actually working, and we see what they did. In order to overcome these challenges, they look in the underlying layer, the transport layer, the TCP, because this um, delay of the performance was introduced in the TCP layer. And there are three features of the TCP which introduce this delay. The first is the three-way handshake. Basically, what it means is that the server needs to send a request to the server. The client needs to send a request to the server. Server needs to acknowledge it, send it back to the client, and then the client asks the real response. Server needs to process this and responds back. This initial handshake took around 50 to 90 milliseconds. And this happens on each request which we create. Another challenge from the underlying infrastructure is the head of line blocking. This is when the client sends a request to the server, and he sends a request for data one, he gets the acknowledge. He sends the request for data two, but this request gets somehow lost in the network, and the server didn't get it. The client then sends another request for data three. Server gets it, but he still waits for data two requests and don't proceed with anything. And this introduces a huge delay. Another thing from the TCP is so-called flow control or the slow start. Basically, what needs to be done here is the client and server needs to negotiate on the sides of the, of the data they need to, ex to exchange. And they start small. First, the client sends a request that he wants 2,048 bytes. Server sends back, and he said, OK, let's try to upgrade it. Let's try it with 4,096. And they, they can continue to the point they cannot exchange information, and they go down. So this slow starts introduce a new delay of the connection. And these are the problems that HTTP tries to solve. HTTP is not a 2 is not a replacement of HTTP 1.1. It's actually addition. And in comparison to HTTP 1.1, HTTP 2 is a binary protocol, while HTTP 1.1 is a text protocol. HTTP2 needs to use the same verbs and resource semantics as we need to work on the existing infrastructure. We cannot introduce a new method or a new semantic, no resources. It has to work the same way. Of course, we need the borders and headers. And another thing which is very interesting is the header optimization. HTTP introduced a header optimization. Why is that? Because in each request and response, we have a header information. And the header information is usually from 500 uh, bytes to 800 bytes, and sometimes it can exceed a kilobyte. And usually this information don't change or change very small amount of time. But we're exchanging it. It's part of the protocol. HTTP tries to solve this by introducing the header optimization, and we'll look at it later on. HTTP2 supports um, SSL, and not only supports its wide use. So there is no point of using HTTP2 without using SSL. Another important thing is that in HTTP2, we have a single connection and a multiple request and response. While in HTTP 1.1, we have 
one request and response per connection. If we need to have more requests and responses, we need to have more connections and we need to maintain them, which is a challenge. Another cool thing is the server push and we'll look at it later on. So I said HTTP2 is binary, but HTTP stands for hypertext. So um, binary text. Um, this is achieved by this binary framing layer, which is introduced on the application layer. So we have the network stack. We have the TOS layer, which is optional, but it's widely used. And then we have the binary layer. What binary layer does, it translates the response and request from HTTP 1.1 to HTTP 2. And what we can see is that we have a header information from the old protocol, which is translated to the header frame. We'll talk about frames later on. And we have the data information, which is translated to the data frame. So what happens is in HTTP 2 is that we're exchanging frames. And these frames can be headers and data frames. Another important thing that we need to know about HTTP2 is the terms. And these terms are streams, messages, and frames. So stream is actually a bidirectional flow of data which happens on the established connection. So we need to have a connection established, and then we can exchange bytes all way. And these bytes can carry one or more messages. A message is actually a sequence of frame which can be mapped to the request and to the response. And the last thing, it's actually the smallest unit of communication of HTTP2 is the frame. And what's important for the frame is that it needs to have information to which stream it belongs to. Here, how it looks like on this diagram. We have a stream one, and there is a request message which carries the header frame, and there is a response which responds back with a header frame and a data frame. And we can have multiple streams in that connection. In order to achieve multiple streams working in one connection, HTTP needs to support what's called multiplexing, and it means that both sides, the client and the server, needs to do multiplexing and demultiplexing, basically understanding which data to which stream it belongs to. And in the same connection, we can carry a lot of streams. Streams can be prioritized. This is actually a very cool feature because now, we have the possibility in the transport layer actually to control and prioritize the data that's coming for. And how this is achieved? This is achieved by the weight of the stream, and this can be an integer from 1 to 500, um, 256. And um, if we have two streams, but they have a different weight, what happens is that the server allocates resources proportionally to their weight. So in this example, we have weights of 12 and 4. The server will calculate it. It will get 16. So it will allocate 12 16 or 3 4 for stream 8 of the resources, and the rest it will be allocated for stream B. Another thing for the streams is that we can have dependencies. And one stream can depend on another. If there is no explicit dependency, this, uh, there is an explicit one which is for the root. But in this example, with uh, streams D and C, what will happen is that the server will process first stream D, and once it's finished, it starts processing stream C. This is the cool thing about the header compression. So, if we look on the requests, we have to request. And the first one contains all the headers. 
and the second one actually repeats the headers, but there's only one change. So what happens is in HTTP2, we send only the change data. This is achieved by the Hoffman's compression, and it mandates that the server and the client need to maintain explicit and dynamic lists of headers. I guess that you all have written a web page, and uh, the first things that a page consists of is basically the JavaScript and CSL. And it's a very known challenge that if there is a request from any kind, there will be a following request which will request something like that. So this was recognized, and what they have decided is that they can introduce a server push. Basically, the server can decide to push some information to the client without client even requiring it. So I know that if the client is wanting index.html, he will want the JavaScript and the CSL. So the server will not wait, he just push it. So this is what the server push does. This is done via the push promise frame, and actually the client can refuse it. So it's in the power of the client to decide if he will accept the data or not. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some demo. The Akamai's page is using the Golang GoFo tiles, and it uh, com can compare actually, again, the same basic example, one image containing, in this case, of 180,000 images, and we can compare what happens with request of HTTP 1 with 200 millisecond latency. So I have a developer tool open at Google, and we can monitor what's going with the requests. And we see the famous waterfall model of the uh, requests and how the page was rolled. So we can see that we have a bunch of six requests. It's very easy to spot that. And this six is a magic number from the browser. The browser limits the connections to six when it communicates to the server. And if we look deeper, for example, in this one, we can see that it was stalled for 951 milliseconds. Then it wait, actually this waiting is time to first byte. So we have a huge delay, and the content download is actually this amount of time, which is 1.2 milliseconds. And this goes down to the top when we have all the images. So they have to wait. So here we have a stall time of 11 seconds. And yeah, let's see how this looks like when we compare it to HTTP2. Do you want me to, to click it again? It was faster. <laughs> So actually what happens is we have one connection, the images are requested via streams, and we have quite good download time. Yeah. We can go deeper and look at the net internals, basically this is a tool which allows you to uh, debug and investigate what's going on with the traffic inside. And if I click on the HTTP 2, I will see what's happening below that. These are the sessions, and if I click this one, I can actually see what's going on. And we see the things we talk about. We have a parent stream of zero, we have some header session information, and so we can drill down and see this is the window size of the information. We have the weight of um, 100 
47 for the stream with ID3. So all the things that we have seen before that, it's actually implemented and it's working and it's cool. So in order to digest what's actually going on, I would like to go back to the first image of the globe. So I want you to lean back and close your eyes. So please do this exercise, it's not that hard. So close your eyes, imagine the globe, imagine all the entire network equipment, all the switches, all the routers, all the wireless routers inside your homes. Imagine the TCP connections that they're managing. Now remove 30% of this TCP connection. So now imagine the headers, so each response and each request in this network is having a header and it's carrying information which is most probably not used and we can remove it. So now open your eyes. Is this cool? Yeah, yeah I think our planet is pretty cool and actually it's the only planet they have found beer on it. There is no other one. Oh, we should love it. <laughs> okay, so we are a developer and we need to know what we need to do in order to enable HTTP2 on our servers. So I'm going to show you what I have done in order to enable HTTP support on my Apache. So I have downloaded and installed Apache 2. I execute this command and it just will execute it. It will say that the model is enabled. Is it visible? Okay, oh, I need to do something. Okay. So the other thing I need to do is I need to open the config files and I need to specify the protocols I would like to use. So in that case, if we look at this page for the virtual host which is running on port 80, I have added this line here. So basically I'm saying I would like to support HTTP2 on both plain text and TOS. So HTTP2 stands for TOS, HTTP2C stands for plain text. And I have done the same for the uh, SSL connection. And here how it looks like. Again, in the virtual host file section, I have added the port, I have listed the protocols, and I have added the certificates. Now, I would like to open a connection to the port 443 and see what's happening. By the way, I have um, directed the output to the div no end. I want only the no content, only the header. So the client is trying to establish a connection. He sends a request and is offering two protocols. So this is one. So LLPN stands for Application Layer Protocol Negotiation. So this is an extension of TLS, and it allows the client and the server to agree on which protocol they will be using it. Then, oops, sorry. Then we see the handshake for the TOS. We see that we have established the session. And then we see that the connection is changed to HTTP2. So basically, this response of uh, HTTP2 200 is what we needed. So, the connection is initiated by the client. The client says, hey, server, I want to agree to HTTP2. 
they agree on the protocol, and then it's happening. We can see that the same on the port 80, and here how it looks like. We don't have the SSL information. The client sends the request. It has a connection upgrade, and there is a header information about the settings. Basically, this contains the number of streams uh, and all the things that we need. And then we see connection upgrade to HTTP2C, which is actually HTTP running without TOS. And some code. Actually, there is a pretty good support of libraries for most of the languages. In that example, I'm using the one of Neti, uh, which is pretty comprehensive and can be downloaded from GitHub. And I just want to show you what it means to run a server and a client in Java. I have configured everything in my development environment, and I can run the server. And I can see in the output that I can go to the browser and see what's going on. So this is intentional. It says, hello world via HTTP 1.1. No upgrade attempted. This is because all the browsers agreed not to support HTTP connection without having TOS. If I want a browser to communicate to a server, I need to enable server to support TOS connection. OK, now I'm going to run the client. And we can see the information in the output. We can see that we have some information exchange for the mod headers list. We have the streams with the IDs and everything we talked about. And if I look on the server, we can see that it's happening again. So first, the attempt was from the browser, which is not proceed. But then we have the information for getting an HTTP 1.1 request, and then it's upgrade to the HTTP 2 connection. Oh, yeah. So this is the upgrade and the information with the HTTP settings. And then we can see the stream IDs, the inbound data. Go away is the frame which says that um, basically the stream ended. There are 10 type of friends, uh, frames, uh, settings, update, and this can be work in the spec. So that was everything I wanted to show. And I would encourage you to get in touch with me if you'd like to. You can find me on LinkedIn or via Untapped. I prefer this social network, and we can have a beer. And now we can open for questions. Okay, if you guys have any questions, please go to one of the three mics in the room. Uh, mic number three. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, in which moment the server decides to close the underlying TCP connection? I think it's when all the streams are completed and there is no more active streams. 
So each stream has states, and these states can change on a certain event. In this case, the go away frame is the frame which closed the stream. So once all the streams are closed, the server decides to close the TCP connection. Mic number three again. Yeah, go ahead. Could you give us a word or two about the current support of uh, server push in the, in the modern browsers? Would you say that it's currently supported widely or it's yet to be adopted? Yeah, it's uh, currently supported widely. All of the modern browser supports HTTP2, which means they need to support uh, a server push as well. No, that's not correct. They don't need to support it. That's an optional extension, but Chrome, for instance, does support it. I think. Let's check. So you, you said Chrome don't don't support it, server push and No no no. Yeah, they didn't support it until like two thousand and seventeen, I guess. That's the last time I checked though. So it looks like it's supported. Not yet on iOS Safari, which is a major player on the market. So you have to request it from Safari to support it. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for the information, though. Uh, not that I necessarily need it, but I have another question. Would you rather say that um, the fight of the HTTP uh, of the of the web consortium uh, regarding the parallelization of the requests is uh, a follow through? of the pipelining movement. So I re clearly remember when pipelining was, uh, was enabled in Firefox. And then every developer was instructed, basically, or recommended to separate his code into different files, which means different requests. And nowadays, we have the counter trend. We have the other movement, which like, empowers developers to put everything in one request, like out the Inline, HTML, inline JavaScript and inline CSS? So I think you're talking file congestion when the client goes to different uh, domains in order to ec take advantage of more connection because it's limited to six. And if it goes to two domains, it expands to 12 and things like that. So if there are such enhancements made on the application layer for HTTP, 1.1, this is not needed anymore and they can be removed. And would you call HTTP2 a magic bullet for stupid developers? No, there's no magic bullet. And Thank uh, you. Uh, <laughs> stupid developers need to get clever and they can do that by reading. Oh. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Uh, uh, my question is regarding the push API and the WebSocket. Is there improvement to uh, use uh, push app instead of the WebSocket currently? I think push API can replace WebSocket. And uh, it basically depends on the how the application is made and it can vary. So. I mean, uh, regarding the performance improvement, do you see a performance improvement? I think yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, do we have any other questions from the audience? In that case, I want to thank Nikki once again. Yeah, thank you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>